chapter eight part one of love among the artists by george bernard shaw this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter eight the autumn passed and the obscure days of the london winter set in adrian herbert sat daily at work in his studio painting a companion picture to the lady of shalott and taking less exercise than was good either for himself or his work his betrothed was at windsor studying greek with miss cairns and music with jack she had carried her point with mrs beatty as to the band mastership and jack had been invited to apply for it but he on learning that a large part of his duty would be to provide the officers of the regiment with agreeable music whilst they dined had unexpectedly repudiated the offer in an intemperate letter to the adjutant stating that he had refused as an organist to be subject to the ministers of religion and that he should refuse as a conductor to be the hireling of professional homicides miss cairns when she heard of this in the heat of her disappointment reproached him for needlessly making an enemy of the colonel embittering the dislike of miss beatty and exposing mary to their resentment jack thereupon left newton villa in anger but miss cairns learned next day that he had written a letter of thanks to the colonel in which he mentioned that the recent correspondence with the adjutant had unfortunately turned on the dignity of the musical profession and begged that it might be disassociated entirely from the personal feeling to which he now sought to give expression to miss cairns herself he also wrote briefly to say that it had occurred to him that miss sutherland might be willing to join the singing class and that he hoped she would be asked to do so over this double concession miss cairns exulted but mary humiliated by the failure of her effort to befriend him would not join and resisted all persuasion until jack meeting her one day in the street stopped her inquired after charlie and finally asked her to come to one of the class meetings glad to have this excuse for relenting she not only entered the class but requested him to assist her in the study of harmony which she had recently begun to teach herself from a treatise as it proved however he confused rather than assisted her for though an adept in the use of chords he could make no intelligible attempt to name or classify them and her exercises composed according to the instructions given in the treatise exasperated him beyond measure meanwhile magdalen brailsford with many impatient sighs was learning to speak the english language with purity and distinctness and beginning to look on certain pronunciations for which she had ignorantly ridiculed famous actors as enviable conditions of their superiority to herself she did not enjoy her studies for jack was very exacting and the romantic aspect of their first meeting at paddington was soon forgotten in the dread he inspired as a master she left church street after her first lesson in a state of exhaustion and long after she had become accustomed to endure his criticism for an hour without fatigue she often could hardly restrain her tears when he emphasized her defects by angrily mimicking them which was the most unpleasant but not the least effective part of his system of teaching he was particular even in his cheerful moods and all but violent in his angry ones but he was indefatigable and spared himself no trouble in forcing her to persevere in overcoming the slovenly habits of colloquial speech the further she progressed the less she could satisfy him his ear was far more acute than hers and he demanded from her beauties of tone of which she had no conception and refinements of utterance which she could not distinguish he repeated sounds which he declared were as distinct as day from night and raged at her because she could hear no difference between them he insisted that she was grinding her voice to pieces when she was hardly daring to make it audible often when she was longing for the expiry of the hour to release her he kept her until mrs simpson who was always present could bear it no longer and interfered in spite of the frantic abuse to which a word from her during the lesson invariably provoked him magdalen would have given up her project altogether for the sake of escaping the burden of his tuition but for her fear of the contempt she knew he would feel for her if she proved recreant so she toiled on without a word of encouragement or approval from him and he grimly and doggedly kept her at it until one day near christmas she came to church street earlier than usual and had a long conference with mrs simpson before he was informed of her presence 
when he came down from his garret she screwed her courage up to desperation point and informed him that she had obtained an engagement for a small part in the opening of a pantomime at nottingham instead of exploding fiercely he stared a little rubbed his head perplexedly and then said well well you must begin somehow the sooner the better you will have to do poor work in poor company for some time perhaps but you must believe in yourself and not flinch from the drudgery of the first year or two keep the fire always alight on the altar and every place you go into will become a temple don't be mean no grabbing at money or opportunities or effects you can speak already better than ninety-nine out of a hundred of them remember that if you ever want to do as they do then your ear will be going wrong and that will be a sign that your soul is going wrong too do you believe me eh yes said madge dutifully he looked at her very suspiciously and uttered a sort of growl adding if you get hissed occasionally it will do you good although you are more likely to get applauded and spoilt don't forget what i have taught you you will see the use of it when you have begun to understand your profession magdalen protested that she should never forget and tried to express her gratitude for the trouble he had taken with her she begged that he would not reveal her destination to any one as it was necessary for her to evade her family a second time in order to fulfil her engagement he replied that her private arrangements were no business of his advising her at the same time to reflect before she quitted a luxurious home for a precarious and vagabond career and recommending mrs simpson to her as an old hag whose assistance would be useful in any business that required secrecy and lying if you want my help he added you can come and ask for it she can come and pay for it and no thanks to you said mrs simpson goaded beyond endurance jack turned on her purple and glaring madge threw herself between them then he suddenly walked out and as they stood there trembling and looking at one another in silence they heard him go upstairs to his garret oh polly how could you said madge at last almost in a whisper i wonder what he's gone for said mrs simpson there's nothing upstairs that he can do any harm with i didn't mean anything he came down presently with an old wash leather purse in his hand here he said to madge they knew perfectly well without further explanation that it was the money she had paid him for her lessons mr jack she stammered i cannot come take it he said she is right the people at windsor pay for my wants i have no need to be supported twice over has she charged you anything for the room no said madge then the more shame for me to charge you for your lessons said jack i shall know better another time here take the money and let us think no more about it good-bye i think i can work a little now if i set about it at once he gave her the purse which she did not dare refuse shook her hand with both his and went out hurriedly but humbly three days after this adrian herbert was disturbed at his easel by mr brailsford who entered the studio in an extraordinarily excited condition mr brailsford i am very glad to what is the matter do you know anything of magdalen she is missing again herbert assumed an air of concern herbert i appeal to you if she has confided her plans to you not to ruin her by a misplaced respect for her foolish secrets i assure you i am as much surprised as you why should you suppose that i am in her confidence you were much in her company during your recent visits to us and you are the sort of a man a young girl would confide any crazy project to you and she have talked together a good deal well we have had two conversations within the last six weeks both of which came about by accident we were speaking of my affairs only you know miss sutherland is a friend of hers she is our leading topic this is very disappointing herbert confoundedly so it is unfortunate and i am sorry i know nothing yes yes i knew you were not likely to it was mere clutching at a straw herbert when i get that girl back i'll lock her up and not let her out of her room until she leaves it to be married when did she go last night we did not miss her until this morning she has gone to disgrace herself a second time at some blackguard country theatre or other and yet she has always been treated with the greatest indulgence at home she is not like other girls who do not know the value of a comfortable home in the days when i fought the world as a man of letters she had opportunities of learning the value of money 
mr brailsford as he spoke moved about constantly pulled at his collar as if it were a stock which needed to be straightened and fidgeted with his gloves i am powerless he added i cannot obtain the slightest clue there is nothing for it but to sit down and let my child go are you aware said herbert thoughtfully that she has been taking lessons in acting from a professor of music during the last few months no sir i certainly am not aware of it said brailsford fiercely i beg your pardon my dear herbert but she is a damned ungrateful girl and her loss is a great trouble to me i did not know and she could not have done it if her mother had looked after her properly it is certainly the case i was very much surprised myself when miss sutherland told me of it especially as i happened to have some knowledge of the person whom miss brailsford employed perhaps he knows who is he and where is he to be found his name is an odd one jack jack i have heard that name somewhere jack my memory is a wreck but we are losing time you know his address i hope i believe i have it here among some old letters excuse me whilst i search herbert went into the anteroom mr brailsford continued his nervous movements bit his nails and made a dab at the picture with his glove smudging it the discovery that he had wantonly done mischief sobered him a little and presently adrian returned with one of jack's letters church street kensington he said will you go there instantly herbert instantly will you come if you wish said adrian hesitating certainly you must come this is some low villain who has pocketed the child's money and persuaded her that she is a mrs siddons i had lessons myself long ago from the great young who thought highly of me though not more so than i did of him perhaps i am dragging you away from your work my dear fellow it is too dark to work much to-day in any case the matter is too serious to be sacrificed to my routine quarter of an hour later mrs simpson's maid knocked at the door of jack's garret and informed him that two gentlemen were waiting in the drawing-room to see him what are they like said jack are you sure they want me certain sure said the girl one of them's a nice young gentleman with a flaxy beard and the other is his father i think ain't he a dapper old toff too give me my boots and tell them i shall be down presently the maid then appeared to mr brailsford and adrian saying mr jacks will be down in a minute and vanished soon after jack came in in an instant mr brailsford's eyes lit up as if he saw through the whole plot and he rose threateningly jack bade good morning ceremoniously to herbert who was observing with alarm the movements of his companion you know me i think sir said mr brailsford threateningly i remember you very well replied jack grimly be pleased to sit down herbert hastily offered mr brailsford a chair pushing it against his calves just in time to interrupt an angry speech at the beginning the three sat down we have called on you mr jack said adrian in the hope that you can throw some light on a matter which is a source of great anxiety to mr brailsford miss brailsford has disappeared what cried jack run away again ha ha i expected as much pray be calm said herbert as mr brailsford made a frantic gesture allow me to speak mr jack i believe you have lately been in communication with the young lady i have been teaching her for the last four months if that is what you mean pray understand that we attach no blame to you in the matter we merely wish to ascertain the whereabouts of miss brailsford and we thought you might be able to assist us if so i feel sure you will not hesitate to give this gentleman all the information in your power you may reassure yourself said jack she has got an engagement at some theatre and has gone to fulfil it she told me so a few days ago when she came to break off her lessons we particularly wish to find out where she has gone to said herbert slowly you must find that out as best you can said jack looking attentively at him she mentioned the place to me but she asked me not to repeat it and it is not my business to do so herbert cried mr brailsford herbert pray remonstrated adrian just allow me one word herbert persisted the other this is the fellow of whom i told you as we came along in the cab he is her accomplice you know you are he continued turning to jack and raising his voice do you still deny that you are her agent jack stared at him imperturbably it is a conspiracy said mr brailsford it has been a conspiracy from the first and you are the prime mover in it 
you shall not bully me sir i will make you speak there there said jack take him away mr herbert adrian stepped hastily between them fearing that his companion would proceed to violence before another word could be spoken the door was opened by mrs simpson who started and stopped short when she saw visitors in the room i beg pardon why it's mr brailsford she added reddening i hope to see you well sir she continued advancing with a propitiatory air i am honoured by having you in my house indeed said the old gentleman with a look which made her tremble so it is you who introduced miss magdalen to this man herbert my dear boy the thing is transparent this woman is an old retainer of ours it was her sister who took madge away before i told you it was all a conspiracy lord bless us exclaimed mrs simpson i hope nothing ain't happened to miss magdalen if anything has you shall be held responsible for it where has she gone oh don't go to tell me that my sweet miss magdalen has gone away again sir you hear how they contradict one another herbert mrs simpson looked mistrustfully at jack who was grinning at her with cynical admiration i don't know what mr jack may have put into your head about me sir she said cautiously but i assure you i know nothing of poor miss magdalen's doings i haven't seen her this past month you understand of course remarked jack that that is not true mrs simpson has always been present at your daughter's lessons she knows perfectly well that miss brailsford has gone to play at some theatre she heard it in i wish you'd mind your own business mr jack said the landlady sharply when lies are needed to serve miss brailsford you can speak retorted jack until then hold your tongue it is clear to me mr herbert that you want this unfortunate young lady's address for the purpose of attempting to drag her back from an honourable profession to a foolish and useless existence which she hates therefore i shall give you no information if she is unhappy or unsuccessful in her new career she will return of her own accord i fear said herbert embarrassed by the presence of mrs simpson that we can do no good by remaining here you are right said mr brailsford i decline to address myself further to either of you other steps shall be taken and you shall repent the part you have played on this occasion mrs simpson as for you sir i can only say i trust this will prove our last meeting i shan't repent nothing said mrs simpson why shouldn't i assist the pretty come said jack interrupting her we have said enough good evening mr herbert adrian coloured and moved towards the door you shall be welcome whenever you wish to see me added jack but at present you had better take this gentleman away herbert bowed slightly and went out annoyed by the abrupt dismissal and even more by the attempt to soften it mr brailsford walked stiffly after him staring indignantly at mrs simpson and her lodger provoked to mirth by this demonstration jack who had hitherto behaved with dignity rubbed his nose with the palm of his hand and grinned hideously through his fingers at his visitor as i told you before said mr brailsford turning as he reached the threshold you are a vile kidnapper and i will see that your trade is exposed and put a stop to as i told you before said jack removing his hand from his nose you are an old fool and i wish you good afternoon shh shh said mrs simpson as mr brailsford with a menacing wave of his glove disappeared you didn't ought to speak like that to an old gentleman mr jack his age gives him no right to be ill-tempered and abusive to me said jack angrily humph retorted the landlady your own tongue and temper are none of the sweetest if i was you i wouldn't be so much took aback at seeing others do the same as myself indeed and how do you think being me would feel like mrs deceit i wouldn't make out other people to be liars before their faces at all events mr jack you would prefer the truth to be told of you behind your back perhaps i sometimes wonder what part of my music will show the influence of your society upon me my giulietta guicciardi give me no more of your name said mrs simpson shortly i don't need them jack left the room slowly as if he had forgotten her meanwhile mr brailsford was denouncing him to herbert from the moment i first saw him he said i felt an instinctive antipathy to him i have never seen a worse face or met with a worse nature i certainly do not like him said herbert he has taken up an art as a trade and knows nothing of the trials of a true artist's career no doubts of himself no aspirations to suggest them nothing but a stubborn narrow self-sufficiency i half envy him 
the puppy exclaimed mr brailsford not attending to adrian to dare insult me he shall suffer for it i have put a bullet into a fellow into a gentleman of good position for less and magdalen my daughter is intimate with him has visited him girls are going to the devil of late years herbert going to the very devil she shall not give me the slip again when i catch her mr brailsford however did not catch magdalen her good looks and her clear delivery of the doggerel verses allotted to her in the pantomime gained the favour of the nottingham playgoers their applause prevented her from growing weary of repenting her worthless part nightly for six weeks and compensated her for the discomfort and humiliation of living among people whom she could not help regarding as her inferiors and with whom she had to co-operate in entertaining vulgar people with vulgar pleasantries fascinating them by a display of the comeliness not only of her face but of more of her person than she had been expected to show at kensington palace gardens her costume almost shocked her at first but she made up her mind to accept it without demur partly because wearing such things was plainly part of an actress's business and partly because she felt that any objection on her part would imply an immodest self-consciousness besides she had no moral conviction that it was wrong whereas she had no doubt at all that petticoats were a nuisance she could not bring herself to accept with equal frankness the society which the pantomime company offered to her miss lafitte the chief performer was a favourite with the public on account of her vivacity her skill in clog dancing and her command of slang which she uttered in a piercing voice with a racy whitechapel accent she took a fancy to magdalen who at first recoiled but miss lafitte in real life mrs cohen was so accustomed to live down aversion that she only regarded it as a sort of shyness as indeed it was she was vigorous loud-spoken always full of animal spirits and too well appreciated by her audiences to be jealous magdalen who had been made miserable at first by the special favour of permission to share the best dressing-room with her soon found the advantage of having a good-natured and powerful companion the drunken old woman who was attached to the theatre as dresser needed to be kept efficient by sharp abuse and systematic bullying neither of which magdalen could have administered effectually miss lafitte bullied her to perfection occasionally some of the actors would stroll into the dressing-room evidently without the least suspicion that magdalen might prefer to put on her shoes rouge herself and dress her hair in private miss lafitte who had never objected to their presence on her own account now bade them be gone whenever they appeared at which they seemed astonished but having no intention of being intrusive retired submissively you make yourself easy dear she said to magdalen i will take care of you lord bless you i know what you are you're a lady but you'll get used to them they don't mean no harm magdalen wondering what jack would have said to miss lafitte's vowels disclaimed all pretension to be more of a lady than those with whom she worked but miss lafitte though she patted the young novice on the back and soothingly assented nevertheless continued to make a difference between her own behaviour in magdalen's presence and the coarse chaff and reckless flirtation in which she indulged freely elsewhere on boxing night when madge was nerving herself to face the riotous audience miss lafitte told her that she looked beautiful exhorted her cheerfully to keep up her pecker and never say die and ridiculing her fear of putting too much paint on her face plastered her cheeks and blackened the margins of her eyes until she blushed through the mask of pigment when the call came she went with her to the wing pushed her onto the scene at the right instant and praised her enthusiastically when she returned madge who hardly knew what had passed on the stage was grateful for these compliments and tried to return them when miss lafitte came to the dressing-room flushed with the exertion of singing a topical song with seven encore verses and dancing a breakdown between each i'm used to it said miss lafitte it's my knowledge of music-hall business that makes me what i am you wouldn't catch me on the stage at all only that my husband's a bit of a swell in his own way he'll like you for that and he thinks the theatre more respectable it don't pay as well i can tell you but of course it's surer and lasts longer were you nervous at your first appearance said madge oh wasn't i though just a little few i cried at having to go on i wasn't cold and plucky like you but i got over it sooner i know your sort 
you will be nervous all your life i don't care tuppence for any audience now nor ever did after my second night i may have looked cold and plucky said madge surprised i never felt more miserable in my life before yes ain't it awful did you hear lefanu stuck up little minx her song will be cut out to-morrow she's a regular duffer she is she gives herself plenty of airs and tells the people that she was never used to associate with us i know who she is well enough her father was an apothecary in bayswater she's only fit to be a governess you're worth fifty of her either on the boards or off madge did not reply she was conscious of having contemplated escape from miss lafitte by attaching herself to miss lefanu who was a ladylike young woman she looks like a print gown after five washings continued miss lafitte and she don't know how to speak now you speak lovely almost as well as me if you'd spit it out a bit more who taught you end of chapter eight part one recording by expatriate in bangor maine